BCFM 93.2. Bristol is, is our community. And now I'm joined by uh, Richard Cotterall. Uh, Richard uh, was uh, an MEP, Member of the European Parliament for the South West of England. Hi, Richard, and welcome to Dialect. Thank you for calling me on. Uh, now, you've just, you're just coming out with a book at the moment, aren't you, about uh, Richard Beeching. Yeah. First of all, yeah. many people, particularly youngsters, haven't heard of this chap. Well, it's hardly surprising, isn't it? Because you have to be of a certain generation, I think, where the mention of the words Dr. Beachy make your blood run cold because you'll have forgotten that there used to be a railway station in the town or the village where you live, which is now just a grassy embankment where formerly happy and joyous people joined trains and went all over the UK and indeed eventually it one supposes all over the world. And Beaching it was, the mass murderer of branch lines and railway stations, in the 1960s, who instigated a kind of, how can we put it, a holocaust of the railway system in the UK. This was not conducted, as the governments of those days pretended, in the interests of producing better value for money, uh, cutting costs, rooting out subsidies, all the usual clap trap. It was about closing down the railways in order to drive people at lorries, onto the roads in ever-increasing numbers to drive the new fantasy of the internal combustion engine revolution, which was supposed to bring happiness and fantasia and joy to all of us forever. Well, so what was in, the motive, so doing, Richard? Sorry, I to interrupt you, but what was the motive behind that? Well, I mean, for, you know, surely that. for most of us, we think, well, actually, the car was actually a more convenient technology that actually won fairly with the railways by superseding it because people could actually drive from door to door with their car. If that were true, which it's not, then it would rule today as the presiding rule. Uh, more people have cars today than ever before. More people have more than one car than ever before. Multi-car households are normal. So how do you explain then that railway passenger transport has now started to approach uh, 2 billion passengers annually, which is a figure which has exceeded the last known peak, which was in 1948. So it isn't just about being able to go from door to door. Of course, the car offers special and extra conveniences in that fact. You don't catch a train to church on Sunday mornings or go to the pub. But you do use it for longer distance, medium-sized trips. It is necessary in many areas as an essential form of communication. So, in effect, you're repeating the old canard that Beeching and his crew came up with, which was, we don't need the railways anymore. We've got cars now, so we should close everything down except a, a skeletal network which will connect a few important cities with London. Now, what about the arguments that were put forward at the time? This is uh, in 1963 for this. Um, one of the main ones being uh, that the railways simply weren't making any money. Uh, another oh. one, another one being um, that it was actually difficult to connect. You know, trains would arrive at the main line station, uh, and people would get off that train just to see a train disappearing off in the distance in the branch line. Who was responsible for that, Tony? Ask yourself the question. This was part of the subliminal beaching cuts. In order to cut the branches off the trunk, um, these failure of connections at important junctions and interchanges were deliberately arranged. It was very simple. That way you could stem the flow of traffic and direct it away from the main spinal system of the railway. It was quite specific. I studied it more or less at the time. But you asked a very important question just before that. You accused the railways of losing money. They were not. I prove in my book that from 1948 onwards to the period where Beeching was installed as the Genghis Khan of the railways, they were in fact operating at a profit. The difficulty was that the governments of those times succeeded in an extraordinary sleight of hand. They forced the railways to borrow money from the Treasury at extortionate rates of interest uh, in order to cover ordinary everyday expenses. This was a kind of repeat of the Danegeld of King Alfred Day, if you look at it in those terms. They also had another ruse up their sleeves, which was even more clever. 
they forced the railways to, and this is quite extraordinary, it could have happened in the Soviet Union, but it certainly happened in the UK, they forced the railways to back pay the government for building the railways in the first place, despite the fact that no railway had ever been built anywhere in the United Kingdom with public money. Quite uniquely, the British railway system was built entirely by private entrepreneurs. This was not the case in the continent. Uh, what about freight, Richard? Because this is one of the things I think many people like me uh, curse, the amount of lorries on our roads today. Now, almost all of that uh, freight used to be managed um, by the state. In fact, uh, I think it was it the British uh, Transport Commission somehow, or British Road Services, uh, had somehow sort of nationalised that. And actually, you could actually turn up even with a, a box of chickens at a railway station and get them shipped to anywhere in the country. Uh, I mean, surely yeah. that just wasn't practical to carry on like that. Why? Why is it not practical? Uh, it's exactly what happens now, except that it's not done by the railways anymore. It's done by courier companies. And the railway had an extremely good courier system. Uh, years and years ago, several hundred years ago, I was a reporter on the Wellington Weekly News down in Somerset. And on printing day, which was Wednesday, uh, I went down to the station at 7.23 in the morning in order to put a parcel, or envelope really, on board uh, an early morning train from Wellington to Exeter St. David, where it would be picked up by a representative of the Express and Echo Company, and then taken to the printing works, and the Wellington Weekly News would be printed on the basis of that important information which had been delivered. The railways had developed an almost seamless system of uh, passing parcels, small objects, large objects, um, wagon-sized objects, uh, capable of being delivered within hours or, at best, overnight. Now, this system was destroyed in order to pass the advantage away from public enterprise to private enterprise. Um, some people can still remember the Red Star parcel system, which British Rail used to run. It was brilliant, absolutely superb. This was broken up in order to benefit private courier companies. But you also have to remember that way into the 1960s, it was still possible for a single wagon to be picked up in a railway station, say, 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning, taken to the nearest hub, which could be anywhere you would care to name. Let's just choose a couple of places in the west of England, Taunton, Bridgewater, Gloucester, Cheltenham, and so forth, put on an overnight link and delivered at the crack of dawn the following morning to the destination. This was a system which was seamless in, in transit. It had been working for years, working for the best part of 100 years, but it was all smashed to pieces in order to benefit the road transport lobby, which delivers at far greater costs, hugely greater costs, than the railways were accustomed to charging. <clears throat> the railways have to meet all their own charges. You, they have no uh, uh, way of getting out of the fact that they are responsible for all their own infrastructure charges, the track, the signaling, railway stations, junctions, whatever. A road transport, a lorry, uses the roads free at the point of use from the perception of the owner and the driver. There is no serious levy on road transport which uh, contributes to the cost of maintaining roads, building roads, Whatsoever. Well, what about car, what about car tax? Own infrastructure costs. Richard, what Not about car, car tax? For, for example, for lorries, it's much more than for cars, <laughs> oh, isn't it? Tony, Tony, don't frighten me with demons at Christmas. Car tax contributes nothing. It used to be known as the road fund license. There is not a single person left alive anywhere in the civil service or anywhere in the political establishment who thinks that a single sou of road tax goes to building or maintaining roads. And even if it did, it would build about 100 yards, not more. Railways must pay everything themselves. Road transport has absolutely no serious charge levied upon it for using the roads. It's very simple. So we've got an unequal uh, balance between two different forms of competition. It would be much better if it were coordinated together and both railways and roads work together, as was postulated in the dying days of the private companies in 1947. Now, just remind us of your, the title of your book, because uh, it's actually all about the man beaching himself, isn't it? And who, who exactly was he? Well, wait a minute. It's not all about beaching himself. 
What I've done is to try to open up the entire transport debate in the UK. And what I've said is that Dr. Beijing is a classic example of the dystopian ability of British transport planners to get absolutely everything wrong, given the chance, starting with Beijing, going through uh, to the Concorde, the aviation disasters, Crossrail, the long delays to building a motorway network in the UK, the last country in uh, developed Europe to have a motorway system. All of these flow from the inability of uh, transport planners and politicians to get a grasp of this use as distinct from the UK, uh, well, as distinct from other countries such as France, uh, Spain, Italy, even of all places, Sweden, all of whom have a much more dynamic and coordinated approach. But you ask me about Beijing. Who was he? Most people think he was an accountant, a bean counter, but he was hired from Imperial Chemical Industries uh, to run his uh, bean counting measures over uh, the British railway system, uh, work out what was losing money, work out what was paying money, and then apply the acts. He wasn't an accountant at all. He was a physicist. And he was involved in the very early stages onwards in the development of what became the British A-bomb project. Uh, he was a brilliant physicist, actually, uh, with a great specialist in uh, metallurgy and tube alloys and blending alloys. And his significant contribution to the atom bomb project was to design the tube down which a projectile would be fired uh, in early forms of atomic bombs in order to set off an, uh, an atomic explosion. He was based at Fort Halstead in Ghent during the war. Uh, he ended up as deputy uh, chief engineer in, in charge of that establishment. It was at that establishment that the atomic bomb project was hatched after the, the British were thrown out of the Manhattan Project on the basis of loose lips, sink ships. But he was never, ever an accountant. He was a physicist. And the way he came to the railways is very strange indeed. He came to the railways because most of his fellow physicists had connections in one way or another to Imperial Chemical Industries, which was the kernel, the nut, and bolt of the British uh, military imperial com uh, complex. And it was in that position that he made so many friends amongst scientists who gravitated to Imperial Chemical Industries, or who came from there, who showered honors upon Dr. Beeching and raised him up to a director of Imperial Chemical Industries uh, before the beginning of the railway adventure. So did he actually have any expertise in railways? Very good at uh, developing little tubes that you need inside a, uh, an atomic bomb, but um, any, any kind of uh, connection with expertise in railway? He liked zip fasteners. When he first went to Imperial Chemical Industries, one of his tasks was to analyse uh, the production rates and efficiency rates of producing zip fasteners, which is something that Imperial Chemical Industries did. And he was absolutely fascinated by it. And I don't think he ever forgot it, because I think he began to, to think when he got to the railways, this was just another exercise in studying the efficiency of zip, fatness, zip fasteners. He had no expertise whatsoever of any kind in business. At ICI, he was the technical director in responsible, responsible for the company's chemical plants. He didn't have any direct responsibility for the financial performance of the company. He had no direct responsibility for the future direction of the company with untoward consequences because, of course, the, uh, the epitaph of the beaching career is that ICI itself collapsed eventually as the 21st century uh, approached because it was in a powerless position and completely unable to, to meet foreign competition. But Beijing knew not only nothing about economics, he knew nothing about business, actually. He was a plain technical director. And I suppose it was also the fact that they knew that he could uh, keep his mouth shut, having worked on the atomic bomb project. Yes, <clears throat> there were other reasons as well. He formed a very strange partnership, a duet, uh, which sometimes... Uh, led to the sort of the, the caricature picture of the, the Walmart and the Carpenter with Alfred Ernest Marples, who was the Minister of Transport at the time of the Beeching Horror. 
And it was very strange, really, because you had this rather large portly gentleman, um, almost like a, a monk, really, in the way in which he formed or didn't form his relationships with other human beings. And this gadabite little fellow, Marples, a Mancunian, um, who, before he rose to fame, uh, organized contraband cigarette sales to Manchester City football fans, joined the Royal Engineers um, as a, a private and ended up as a captain, and then got himself a seat, safe seat as a Tory and was uh, smiled upon greatly by Harold Macmillan because he was put in charge of the, uh, of the plan to build a million council houses in order to cure the post-war housing shortage. Marples was a dancing uh, marionette. It was quite extraordinary how he formed this amazing personal friendship uh, with uh, Beeching, which went so deep. The Beeching used to go on holidays uh, in the Beaujolais country, where Marples owned a vineyard. There was no real parallel of this at all, because you had two intellectual uh, and, and human opposites, the introvert, absolute total introvert Beeching, and the absolute total extrovert, uh, and, and subsequently exposed as a criminal, Marbles. Okay, your book is entitled Bomber Beaching uh, mm -hmm. and His War on the Railways. Uh, yeah. what, why do you say a war? Because, I mean, for many people at the time, they said, well, you know, actually the network does need to be pared down a little bit. And essentially that's what he did, is he took out some of the, the external bits. He left, he left the hub of the rail network still intact. I totally disagree with you. He took out everything that was either remotely profitable or about to be. If you go back to the argument which you made earlier, that you made sure that the uh, branch line trains didn't connect with the main line trains, then, of course, you, my case is proven. But my case is proven simply by the fact that with a, a network of uh, two-thirds the size of that which Beijing inherited, we're looking at something like two billion and maybe rising to 2.2 billion uh, passengers per year. This is, makes it uh, almost the most intensely used passenger railway in the, in the European Union, aside from the Deutsche Bahn and SNCF, uh, Chemin de Fer Francais. And so it, it's an entire, entirely faulty argument to say that he cut costs. In fact, if we still had that third, if the missing third was still operating today, then we would already be at 2.2, 2.3, 2.4 billion passengers a year. He closed railways, like the Great Central Railway, which connected northern England with London and was intended to connect London and thus northern England with the Channel Tunnel and run straight through it, built to continental loading gauge standards. He shut that solely and completely as a sop to the road transport lorry. They wanted all that business uh, low transport. They wanted all that business for themselves, from the continent uh, through to London, up to the north. And what do we read now? I read today in the newspaper that 12 miles of the Great Central Railway, the only continental loading gauge railway ever built in the UK, are now having to be uh, reconstructed at a cost of millions upon millions in order to accommodate the proposed HS2 high-speed trains to the north. Our Railway history, our transport history in the UK is cluttered with nonsense like this. We get every decision wrong. When the French want to build a railway, they sit down, work out where it's going to go, and build it out of thing. They set themselves a target and set themselves a budget. It's very, very simple. My book tells the story of the incredible rows that went on in London in the attempts to strangle Docklands at birth by denying it a tube extension, and the amazing performance of the ballerina Thatcher uh, in this affair. Every time we are presented with what seemed to be a straightforward strategic decision, let's have better transport, let's have better roads, let's have better railways, let's have better waterways even, we will screw it up every single time. And the beaching episode is just one illustration of that, although actually a catastrophic illustration of that. But you can see another one in Bristol where you were calling from now. Instead of bundling everything into the Concorde, which was a predictable disaster, everything was put into it, which then destroyed civil aviation 
as an independent business in the UK. It was all handed away to the Americans and to the French, even the Canadians. Nobody in the UK now builds civil airliners anymore. It was another classic example of elitism, gigantism, uh, empirism, commonwealthism, all speaking louder than common sense. And we do this over and over again. Closing the railways was a mistake, a total mistake. Uh, now, I wonder what role the oil industry played, because, I mean, they're obviously a very, very okay. powerful international organisation. Yeah. I mean, they'd much That's rather right. us all have a little engine each to one per family rather than, you know, one coal-burning train, as they were at the time, or at least, you know, the oil industry yeah. must have had some financial motives in order uh, for the railways yeah. to be closed because it's meant the, the, the proliferation of the motor car. Yes, and if you look at... What I've written in my book about the British motoring industry, good, good Lord, what a disaster that was. Look at the billions which were poured, billions that we're talking in terms of creating money spent then to its value now, billions poured into woe-begotten car manufacturing enterprises, uh, every one of which lost money. British uh, car manufacturing was a dinosaur by the beginning of the 60s. So it was irresponsible to point the finger at the railways when the car industry had managed to create a museum of automobile freaks. And that was the end. Nothing ever grew any further from that. But the oil industry wanted people in cars, on roads, not in trains. That was why all the tramways were destroyed in the United Kingdom. It was why exactly the same thing happened in the United States of America, which had uh, literally hundreds of streetcar systems, all of which were bought up by Detroit and closed down. It was no different in the UK. It was simple, simply an extension of the same strategy. Uh, okay, Richard, could you just remind us of the title of your book and whereabouts people can buy it online and when from? Because it's just literally being published this week, isn't it? Yes, we hope. <laughs> Publishing online is something I've never done before, uh, and I'm only doing it as a temporary expedient, but it's called uh, Doctor Who, The Atomic Bomber Beaching and His War on the Railways, A Disturbing Case of Double Vision. And I think for the benefit of listeners now, an easy place to find it will be Amazon Kindle, for example, but uh, uh, many other sites, including um, Smashwords, Apple, Google, will also be covering it. There will be, I only learned this today, a print version as well, but for the moment we're getting it up in a little bit of a rush because this is uh, the old mass murderer's uh, centenary this month. You would be 100 years old to see uh, the railways booming as they are now, if you were able to come back in these TARDIS from the great beyond. So we are really rushing this out now so that people can, can, can get an entirely new uh, approach. There are some dreadful books that have appeared, Tony, on this. Hagiographies, How He Saved the Railways. <laughs> it brings tears to my eyes. Uh, and one thing I will say is that you've got quite a lot of stuff on Southwestern Railways, haven't you? Yes, uh, a tremendous amount. Uh, my own episodes in Bristol concerning the ATA light rail system, which still rankle to this day. But quite often I give examples, uh, plucked from the west of England, my own hometown, Wellington, which lost its railway station, uh, the Morton Hampstead branch line, which is a classic example of closing a highly profitable branch line, largely by retiming uh, the connections. So they missed everybody, missed all the exp express trains, Never. And lots of other local examples. So it's the same pattern, really, which is uh, repeated everywhere in the UK. But naturally enough, I've, I've used some experiences which uh, are very familiar to me. OK, Richard Cottrell, thanks very much for joining us on Dialect. Uh, thank you. BCFM 93.2. Bristol is, is our community.